right. I think it is a good time to start. It is straight up 11. Jamie, are we rolling? Are we live? Excellent. My executive producer in the back, we have to make sure we're good. Hi, I'm Dr. Emily Stacy. Welcome uh, to the 2022 Spring Great Debate Panel. Uh, this one will focus on the midterm elections. A uh, pretty hot topic, of course. Uh, so I am, again, your coordinator and moderator, uh, professor of political science here at Rose State College, and I'm super excited to have you uh, here from this panel uh, of election and campaign practitioners uh, and experts. So before I introduce our panelists, and I'm going to do just a brief, uh, a very brief introduction that I pulled from you know websites. So please feel free to fill in the blanks there. Uh, before I introduce them, uh, I do need to thank uh, Dr. Anita Poole Inslee as well as the wonderful Connie Myrick who just walked out uh, for putting all of this together. Every time uh, we put on an event, uh, their team works hard to make everything look gorgeous uh, and put you know the panels together, etc. Uh, James Davenport, the younger, our technician uh, and executive producer, making sure that everything is zooming. Uh, perfectly and making sure that we are getting recorded, uh, as well as my division leadership, uh, Dean Tony Castillo, who is here uh, and always here to support me, which is wonderful. Uh, my associate dean and co-pilot uh, in, you know, political uh, crimes, you know, Dr. Uh, Professor James Davenport, soon to be Dr. James Davenport. We're pushing him very hard in that. Uh, and I would also like to thank my faculty colleagues who are here uh, in the audience to support us as well. Uh, so thank you again for attending this panel. Uh, welcome to Rose State College and our lovely First National Bank ballroom uh, that we are very excited to continue to use. So uh, again, our panel's credentials are pretty impressive. Uh, need a qualifier there. They're very impressive. Uh, we're extremely lucky uh, to have such a knowledgeable group on campus to discuss the 2022 uh, midterms at a local, state, uh, and national level. Uh, so she actually sat in a perfect space. My first bullet point uh, is Dr. Jan Hart, professor from uh, of political science. I'm sorry, from the University of Central Oklahoma, and one of my formative professors, uh, Mr. Taz Al Michael. Uh, he is the national vice president of the College Democrats of America, uh, director of development at the Foundation for Liberating Minds, which I want to know more about. Uh, my new best friend uh, in politics, uh, Ms. Angel Ellis, she is the director uh, of media for the Muscogee Creek Nation, uh, and so she is representing uh, a whole wonderful population uh, within our great state. Uh, and we know from the last panel, at least, uh, that Native politics is extremely important uh, to all politics uh, in the state of Oklahoma. Mr. Chad Alexander, probably our uh, celebrity on stage, right? Uh, political insider, radio host, campaign manager, former campaign manager uh, to J.C. Watts, former chair uh, of the Oklahoma Republican Party. And this is pretty impressive. Probably the youngest to ever be uh, elected or nominated to that position at age 27. Thought was pretty cool. Uh, state political director on two Republican presidential campaigns as well. And last but not least, Dr. Rick Farmer. Uh, he is the Dean of the J. Rufus Fears Fellowship at the Oklahoma Council on Public Affairs. Uh, and I could go on and on about his institutional knowledge, but you know, I won't embarrass him on stage. He is fantastic and knows pretty much everything there is uh, about Oklahoma politics, the ins and outs. So please welcome our panel. So, as we're all aware, uh, 2022 was always going to be a contentious midterm season uh, in our hyperpolarized American society. Uh, with recent events taking place, particularly at a state level, uh, such as the Senate race uh, and uh, your governor being primaried, uh, I look for the campaign cycle to become more volatile uh, as time goes on. Uh, this may be the first time I've noticed uh, in my 37 years of kind of being cognizant, uh, really alive, uh, that I've seen an incumbent or sitting governor uh, start to run campaign ads well before candidate filing. I don't know that I've seen that ever um, in, in my years. So we are witnessing as well uh, an adept use of dark money uh, to run a campaign against it from the right of him, which is again pretty unprecedented in Oklahoma politics. We really don't see that very often. So as we sit and pontificate on the election possibilities today, uh, candidate filing is obviously in full force for the second day. It started yesterday uh, and roughly around 375 candidates had filed uh, as of end of day 5 p.m. yesterday. Um, so it is literally off to the races. Uh, so 
I want to bring in our panel at this point uh, and just begin with a general uh, kind of overview question. Uh, so what is your political or et oh, I'm sorry, electoral outlook for the 2022 campaigns? Uh, what, kind of just generalize please, uh, are you expecting uh, the campaigns to be like? Uh, are you expecting hyperpolarized or contentious campaigns uh, or more of a return to campaigning as usual, uh, less mudslinging uh, than the last two elections? And I, it's an open panel, so whoever wants to begin. All righty. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Taz Al Michael. My pronouns are he, him, his. In addition to being the former vice president of College of Democrats of America, um, I uh, serve as a partner at a political firm called Laws and Tactics. Actually, um, I don't know, doctor, if you've had Adriana Laws in your class before, but she's actually one of my political business partners. And I also work as a director of programs for Oklahoma Progress Now, which if you see us on Twitter, we're the ones who are, um, you know, calling people out because that's what we like to do best as progressives because, you know, in this state, we play way too Midwestern nice. So um, the big thing that I would really say in terms of like a political and electoral outlook, and again, I mean, this is me coming from a Democrat. Do I think Kevin Stitt is going to win the governorship again? Yes, yes, I do. Um, and do I hope that Joy Hoffmeister puts up a hell of a fight? Yes, yes, I also do. Um, but for me, whenever it comes to building out uh, political power, especially on the left or for Democrats in particular, um, I believe in local first. And then this is something that also that Republicans have employed in the past as well. Um, you know, we get in, they get involved in nonpartisan elections. I think if you most recently saw in Norman, uh, the mayor of Norman, Bria Clark, who is a registered Democrat, uh, ran and lost by three points, was out knocked by 1,200 votes. I was actually a co-campaign manager on that campaign. Um, and a lot of people are are genuinely within the democratic atmosphere kind of nervous because they're saying like, well, if this can happen to Norman, this can happen everywhere else. And that's true because the number one thing for you to be able to win a campaign, I mean, yes, there's mail, yes, there's TV advertisements, but the most effective way is for me to have a personal conversation with you, which means knocking on your door or having a phone call. Um, Oklahoma County um, is one of the places where we're particularly targeting. I represent seven different clients um, who are going to be running on the county level. And the idea is to go back and take back municipal government. If you have local control, then it makes it easier later on down the line. Uh, personally, I don't think this state is flippable for at least on the Democratic side for another 10 years just being honest with you. Um, and for me, it's like an order of which counties are we gonna be going first. For me, it's Oklahoma County, then Cleveland County, and slash Tulsa County, then Comanche County, Muskogee County, places where we consider democratic strongholds but need to be built out more. Um, you wanna have a place that's as liberal as Houston, you gotta make sure you conquer your place as liberal as Houston. Um, it's all about building the block. Um, and then in terms of making, uh, asking whether it's going to be more hyper-polarized and contentious campaigns, I do. I think so. I 100% think so. I think it's only, um, there's not necessarily a way to go back from this. Um, we're, you know, the whole niceties of uh, bipartisanship and stuff like that, I think as far as I'm concerned, only exist in the capital and if you have personal relationships. But out here in the campaign world, not so much. So no more kissing babies then? Absolutely not. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> COVID kind of makes kissing babies hard. Um, I just, just from that perspective, I mean, I feel like the contention that we feel is just the beginning of the iceberg, and it's going to radically intensify as we get into things. Um, and as a native person and a, a native person of a certain age, this is the most ethno stress I've felt in my life, and it's getting turned into a boiling point. Um, and I think that that will continue. Um, when you look at polarization of headlines and those those messages that they're putting out, you have to really kind of think of these places in Oklahoma that are the uh, news deserts and don't have information trickling into them. And that's going to be a very big factor, and it always has been, ever since the news industry has been sort of drying up the local, local news. And so that's gonna be a real problem because it gives no one um, an opportunity to be like, I'm in Okmulgee County and how is this election you know, impacting me specifically? It almost c cuts them completely off from this. So the information is going to be critical and information consumption is going to be critical for those out there consuming news. You're going to have fatigue and you're going to be bombarded and you're going to have to work really hard because things like prior restraint, sponsored messaging is going to be used to basically obliterate your brain cells. 
Uh, I kind of look at it from the perspective in uh, 2020, I felt like I was covering more of a cultural election than an issue driven election mm -hmm. that we normally have in campaigns that I've been involved. I've been, this is my 28th year. My fellow, uh, my first campaign was with JC Watson, 1994. And I was in his shop for eight years, ran his political shop, but, um, there will be a lot of issues this year that are, uh, going to be going back to more of the, uh, what I would call more normal election year issues. If you look at national polling, uh, this is from CBS on Sunday. And I mean, the elephant in the room is always the party in power. You have an incumbent president. That's why we call it a midterm. Um, if you look at crime, and this is from CBS news poll. If you look at crime, Bryden has an approval of 39 and disapproval of 61. If you look at immigration, uh, Biden has an approval of 38, disapproved 62. The economy, approval of 37, disapproved 63. Inflation, 31, and disapproved 69. Mm -hmm. And when we poll nationally, if you look at it, we usually poll about 36 to 37% Democrat, 31 to 32% Republican, uh, and the rest independent, not party. And so at a 31 fave on inflation with a 69 unfave, that's about five points, four points under what the Democrat base we would actually poll at a national poll would be of a thousand voters across the country. And so I think you're going to see a lot of these issues are the main issues. When you poll it nationally of one of the most important issues, uh, COVID's down to 9%, which is a lot different than where we were in 2020. Um, but I could tell you, I poll Oklahoma for different clients about once a month on the top issues. Uh, you have education, which is always one of the top issues in Oklahoma, but it's also um, crime, it's uh, inflation, and it's economy and jobs are the top four issues. When you get down into social issues, those are all in the single digits, every one of them. And I don't think it's that actually much different nationally when you look at the polls, except for education doesn't really register federally as a top issue because it's seen more as a state issue but it's always a top issue in Oklahoma when it comes to things. And so um, I think Democrats in Oklahoma with Joe Biden having a 25% favorable right now, uh, if the elections were held today, that would be a disaster. Now, six months from now, you could say is a long time in politics, but I think with what we see with supply chain issues, energy issues, the fact that we get so much fertilizer across the country um, from Russia, which we were not gonna be getting because of the Russia-Ukraine war, um, you look at the production of, uh, that we get out of Ukraine when it comes to wheat and fertilizer as well. Uh, they're looking at probably about 30% of what they would normally be supplying. And so there's going to be some food issues and supply chain issues there as well. And those are probably going to hit in the fall right before the election. Um, I kind of look at it like this right now. When you have those kind of numbers uh, this close to an election, it's kind of like turning a uh, aircraft carrier on a dime. It's going to be very, very difficult uh, I think uh, President Biden is going to have to catch an awful lot of breaks uh, because if you look at where his favorability is now, uh, if a president has a favorability over a 50, they still usually lose a handful of seats in the U.S. Congress to the opposition party. Um, he's at the type of numbers of Trump at 18 or Obama in 2010. Obama lost 63 seats in 2010 election midterms. Uh, George W. Bush had awful losses in the 2006 midterm elections and of course Trump's midterm election lost the United States Congress. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think if everybody's going to put money on it, we believe Republicans are going to be in charge of the United States House of Representatives after we get through November. And so this will be a pretty political, tough political environment in Oklahoma. I saw Colin Walkie, a uh, representative, announced today he's now seeking re-election. 87 actually is a swing seat. Uh, there are Democrats that have very safe seats in Oklahoma's legislature, but that's one. Uh, that Republicans are definitely going to go after knowing that he's out, but uh, not knowing until the day before filing closes, if there's not already a Republican out there, they may not be a competitive <laughs> race there. Uh, and there's always surprises during filing. Uh, but, you know, it'd be the elephant in the room if we weren't ignoring the fact that the party of power usually loses seats in the midterm elections. And then when you look at the current president's favorability right now and where he is on the issues, um, just to be honest with you, even David Laxerod, who's a pollster for Barack Obama, said this. There's not really any good news for Democrats in the polls that are coming out right now. I think you have to look at a couple of things. I agree with you. I think Democrats are bound to lose the House. Um, estimates say anywhere between 17 and 25 seats. Um, most people are saying it's not going to be 
what they call a shellacking, which is the term that Obama used in 2010 um, when they did lose the 60-some seats. Um, but I would say it's a fair game for anywhere between 17, 20, 25 seats for the House. Um, the Senate is a different ball game. Um, and the Senate is a different ball game because the Democrats only have 14 seats up in the Senate, in the U.S. Senate. And so that makes a big difference um, because there's 33, 34 seats up in every two years, and the Democrats only have 14. Now, of those three seats, some of them um, right now are looking a little shaky. Um, Arizona looks a little bit interesting if Ducey decides to um, kick in against Kelly. Uh, the Georgia seat, um, uh, Herschel Walker is actually, for some strange, odd, I can't believe it reason, um, is actually pulling ahead of Warnock. Um, and that's not because I'm against Republicans or I'm against Democrats. Herschel Walker has said some really stupid things. Um, and also has a series of uh, female allegations against him, so let's just put it that way. Um, but I think one of the other issues that we haven't talked about yet is redistricting mm -hmm. and how that is affecting some of these states. Um, the Democrats could pick up anywhere between like one and four seats um, from redistricting, but I don't think that's going to make up for all the things that are working against the Democrats, most notably the fact that it's a midterm election and Democrats control the House, the Senate, and the presidency. Well, I wanted to go back and pick up on what do we think the tenor of the election mm -hmm. is going to be. And the first thing I want to say is elections have always been bad. And so I'm not sure that there is a time when it was less. Well, that's fair. Uh, I mean, ma, ma, where's my pa? It was a, a pretty mean jingle. The things that were said about Thomas Jefferson are still getting him canceled 200 years later. So um, Thank God. Good. politics <laughs> politics has always been. I'm sorry, I missed the comment. Oh, I just said thank God. Oh, okay. But he's still getting canceled 200 years later. <laughs> well, anyway, he's still being canceled for the things that were said about him 200 years ago. I, I think the, the main difference between campaigning then and campaigning now is that it's ever present. It's constantly in our face. It's on our phone. It's on our TVs. Uh, we can't really get away from it, whereas before it was something like you went to the town square, the local pub, you hang out with some people, uh, you heard these rumors, you went back to your farm, and you didn't talk to anybody about it for a week or a month. And so it's, it's just a lot more with us than it was then, but it's not that campaigns are better uh, or, or are worse. Uh, I do think there are some things that have contributed to it being so vitriol, so mean. Uh, one of those things is Citizens United. So maybe you guys want to talk about that here in a minute. But a Supreme Court case that says that uh, money is free speech and you can uh, put your money together with other people's money and basically be anonymous in the way that money gets spent. And so that's, a lot, that's taken away a lot of the accountability mm -hmm. and allowed people to be really mean without being identified as to who's being mean. Although once in a while we read in the paper who those people actually are, but mostly it creates some anonymity. And so I think that's, that's helped to make it worse. I also think that social media uh, has helped to make it worse. And yeah. Taz, I, I think something that you said illustrates this, and that is that what progressives want to do because they're not, they, they, they're finished with these Midwestern niceties, that we want to call people out. Well, that's what Twitter incentivizes you to do is you get attention when you call people out. And I think that's, that's made it worse. Uh, and I agree with whoever it said that it hasn't even started to get bad yet for 2020 it, or yeah. 2022. It's going to get a lot worse. I, I guess the one thing I, I would say about Governor Stitt's ads is there is a dark money group out there running advertising and sending mail against him. There are three groups. Yeah. Mm. Okay. <laughs> there are three groups. They have pledged a very large sum of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why he's running his mm -hmm. paid advertising even before filing is because he's already being attacked and he already has to lay that groundwork. I, I, 
I think that's what's going on there. Yeah. I'd like to add something to that, especially, and I always love talking at colleges and high schools. They're my two favorite places to go. Social media is not real when it comes to campaigns. Mm -hmm. sure. I poll Oklahoma yeah. for different clients about once a month. Mm -hmm. The number of registered voters when you poll that are on Twitter, 7%. 93% of the electorate's not on Twitter. And Facebook's the same way. You have a very low proportion of registered voters that are on those groups. And so don't get sucked into thinking that's real life. Yeah, go viral and nobody really cares. And yeah. Dr. Hart was my professor, and I respect her very much. But on the House of Representatives, I'll take 40 on the over-under. I think it's over 40. Um, <laughs> and on the U.S. Senate, I would tell you that I think Nevada is a huge problem for Democrats. Yeah. Absolutely. Because right now Cortez they've Masto been polling has to get behind by about four stick. points. But this was a poll that was released out of Nevada, uh, 500 voters. Uh, statewide, and I pay more attention to this than what the top ballot is right now. Sure. Somebody in my business, I go into the cross mm -hmm. tabs right now, know what the ballot says, but this question was asked in Nevada. I want my vote in November to support the direction President Biden is leading the nation, 26.8%. I want my vote in November to change the direction Biden is leading in the nation, 47%. Uh, my vote this November doesn't have much to do with President Biden and his policies, 21 percent, undecided, 4.4. Um, being an incumbent Democrat senator who's being polling consistently behind three or four points for about three months, you never want to be behind when you're incumbent. But it's those kind of questions that people in my business look at as the undercurrent of what's going to drive the electorate. So I do think Arizona can be competitive, but I actually think Nevada is more likely of a flip. Uh, I think New Hampshire is very possible to be a flip. Uh, New Mexico is a little bit more of a long shot, but the numbers Biden has there because oil and gas is such a heavy issue. That's, I mean, that's their economy. Uh, and also Georgia as well. What about well. Pennsylvania? I think Pennsylvania will be the toughest seat Republicans defend, absolutely. Um, voter Especially registration there has been, the last year voter registration <laughs> there has been pretty good for Republicans. They've picked up Dr. about 300,000. Um, well, I'm not getting into candidate specifics. I'm just talking about the overall okay. political environment. I but think I, I think you got to get into candidate specifics. I, I mean, but we don't Mitch know McConnell nominee, himself well, I, said. I don't know who the nominee is yet. Right. We Mitch are, McConnell himself primary. said Republicans have a really, and that's the, obviously the Senate minority leader, but he himself said, you know, we've got a good chance if we don't blow it. And the way that we blow it is to elect candidates like we elected in 2010 or primary or nominate candidates like we nominated in 2010 and 2012. Right. And, look, well, and I, I see a couple of candidates that could. I do agree that could... that's the biggest defense our Republicans are going to have. Right. But what I find interesting is my entire political career, we've really considered Florida a swing state. Mm -hmm. And the senatorial committee is not playing there against Rubio. And the Democrat Governor Association is not playing there against DeSantis. Yeah. And right. so Florida has kind of been taken off the map. And Ohio mm -hmm. used to be considered a swing state. Uh, you know, it was always, could you win Pennsylvania, Florida, and Ohio for about two decades? Um, but Ohio, I think Trump won by nine. Um, so I think Republicans are good there. Uh, but I do think Pennsylvania will be the most difficult to defend for Republicans. You heard it here first, folks. Florida no longer a swing state. <laughs> I'm going to start using that in our classes, Davenport. Um, you guys kind of touched on my second question. Um, so if you want to keep it short, that's perfectly fine. Um, but clearly, the country and the world has been through a lot of volatile events uh, spanning from January 6th of last year uh, to the current war in Ukraine. Um, and uh, Mr. Alexander kind of touched on this question, as I said. Um, what are the biggest issues to voters, uh, and how critical are they to the votes being cast? Is it just the kitchen table? I, number one's inflation. Okay. I mean, right now you're seeing it um, in the polling. That's what people are talking yeah. about when they're out. Just eight point five percent increase. You can't. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I would add to that that um, just watching the polls for decades now, decades. <laughs> We're old. We are. Uh, but. Uh, the, the pocketbook issues are almost always the number one issue at the national level. So that's not really different. I mean, usually it's jobs, but uh, this time it's probably inflation, but it's still the pocketbook issue. And um, I'm also old enough to have lived through Jimmy Carter's presidency, and I'm pretty sure there's a recession coming, and it may hit before November. 
And yeah. so it actually could be unemployment by the time we get to November. Uh, but either way, I, I think the number one issue nationally is always pocketbook issues. Uh, uh, also, I think at the state level, uh, polling almost always shows, and I know there have been a couple of exceptions, but it almost always shows that the number one issue for voters in Oklahoma is education. That's usually the number one issue. And uh, Republicans are pretty mad about education right now. I was and add. and the, the, let me just make this one. Uh, the, the one thing that we haven't talked about we probably should is the enthusiasm gap. I was going to say, like my issues in particular are more so focused on local um, rather than national because I don't think Democrats really have it in the back on the national campaigns. But whenever it comes to Oklahoma in particular, I agree, education is the number one issue by and large. The second thing is criminal justice and justice reform. Um, there, you know, I like to make the argument to everybody that Oklahoma is the Australia of America, in which the way that how we've treated our indigenous Americans or black Americans, the way that we, uh, I mean, we're a prison state, like let's just be honest, every single, like we know somebody, if not <laughs> ourselves, who have gone through some form of justice involvement. Um, some, most people have either a family member or friends of a family member um, who has been incarcerated and we incarcerate more people than anywhere else in the entire country which means the entire world um, and you know you're seeing for example again with like these um, these independent expenditures that are coming from the right that are asking for governors to, to be tougher on crime and I'm just like how much more tough can you actually get when literally all you do is incarcerate more and more and more people illegally, um, illegally right um, the other thing too is like Oklahoma County in specifically um, the Oklahoma County Jail is a huge issue with its overpopulation um, it's a pretrial detention center but as far as I'm concerned it's the closest place to hell that we have in Oklahoma so <laughs> Um, and so those are the two particular things that I think is going to be on the ballot. I know a lot of us, um, you know, um, myself including, participated a lot with the Julius Jones campaign and bringing issues um, and awareness to that. Um, again, you recently saw with like the vouchers that had failed also in the state government as well. Um, people, especially in more agricultural communities, don't want to see their tax dollars being taken out of their schools. And I mean, you see that with Joy Hoffmeister also running for office too. The number one issue that we keep banging over and over and over and over again is education. That's why you saw back in 2018, a whole bunch of teachers decide to run for office in the first place. I mean, you all are sitting right here right now too. The, the expenses of whenever, uh, when it comes to college consistently keeps going up and up and up. Combine that with inflation, the economy is the third, I would say, like one of the, the biggest issues that we have right now. It's so expensive. The most tangible issues that we have are the ones that are facing our pockets. So. I just think that that's like one of the like sad like traps we fall into in Oklahoma is that our issues with our pockets are not really directly always related in our minds to information because like right now at the state level freedom of information act has been attacked things like this are a very prominent thing in the minds of those who are watching information in this state those who are seeking information and they don't even know who's associated with it or what, what that threat really encompasses but we're going to start seeing the more these tangible pocketbook problems affect me, who is just the average person, the more I become incentivized to start breaking out of those traps and start looking at why have I been marginalized and fraction, fractionated from the actual issues. And then you start seeing those little pockets of interest spreading out. So now if you're a woman in Oklahoma, if you're a person who knows someone who's ever been incarcerated, if you're an indigenous person, you're going to be seeing McGirt all over the place and it's going to be quite awful. Um, the, all of these things are going to shape how these trends are kind of happening and that there's a different feel on those really small levels because you start taking money out of rural schools, you start killing rural communities because sometimes these schools are the biggest employers in that community and this kind of shifts things and people think differently anybody else on this question and i think you see that in terms of the education front in terms of disinformation i mean i can mm -hmm. see several national campaigns um, including a virginia governor's race that were run on the issue of 
we've got to take CRT out of our schools. And whatever you think about CRT, um, CRT is not taught to kindergartners. Um, CRT is not taught to middle schoolers. It's just not an issue at those levels. It's a college level theory. Um, and so if it's a college level theory, it has nothing to do with elementary schools. And so you see that on a number of issues where misinformation is being, I mean, I'm just thinking of the recent uh, Supreme Court fight um, nomination over pedophilia. I mean, almost every single justice, including the last three Trump justices, so this is bipartisan, the last three Trump justices plus Judge Jackson all had records where their um, were giving sentences that were less than the required amount. All four of them. Um, and it was not a big difference, it was not a large difference, but when you pick and choose, or as I call it, cherry pick, um, things to talk about, you can always find things to uh, criticize somebody for. There is one thing I did want to add, however, though. So um, she had mentioned, you know, the Virginia governor's race, and you know, a lot of people like to use that as an indicator of what's going to be happening um, politically wise um, across the spectrum. While, and you know, there's been a lot of critiques as to whether or not running against Trump was the big idea after this. And I'm going to be honest with you, especially for those on the left, running against Trump is not the solution. You have to run on the issues. It is issues, then identity, then geography. Across the board, progressives actually outperform moderate Democrats. They ended up taking more local seats. And as far as we see here, I do see us taking over some more Democratic primaries. We do best in those sort of circumstances. Um, there's a candidate that I'm actually working with out in Connecticut. Right, the the coasts and you know the, the the heart of the country are not as different as we like to imagine. Uh, whenever it comes to issue-based politics, you know the the voter enthusiasm in the district that he's running in Connecticut, he only needs thirty thousand votes in order to win a congressional primary. It's a safe Democratic seat. And so you know we talk about whether or not these elections are becoming more polarized. Yeah, they absolutely are. And the ones who are honestly falling in the middle are falling behind. So, Dr. Fermer, then you want to bring up the enthusiasm gap because I think it lends itself to this line of conversation. Uh, sure, but actually, I wanted to pick up on sure. something that you said there about polarization because I, th I think it's really important. So, Dr. Hart and I are political science professors, and for decades, uh, probably before us, though, decades before us. For, for decades, political scientists argued that they wished that the political parties would diverge and create a difference and allow people to make a choice between different, uh, di different policy ideas and why are the parties so similar? And, we, and this was an argument that political scientists made for many, many, many years. Well, now they've gotten their wish and we're all like, hey, this is really bad. We don't like this. And so I think the answer is be careful what you wish for because this polarization is actually something that political scientists said would be a good thing. Um, the enthusiasm gap, I, uh, Chad, you may have seen some polling uh, uh, more than, than I have, but uh, there's like a 15% difference between Republicans saying, I'm excited to go vote this year, and Democrats saying, I'm not so excited to go vote this year. And before anyone ever thought to measure the enthusiasm gap, so maybe 15 years ago or 20 years ago, I used to tell students, the side that's going to win is the one that's the most angry. Yeah. And if you think about that, the side that's going to win is the one that's most angry. That's what's driving our advertising. Mm -hmm. Make people angry. And if you look at what's going on this year, Republicans are far more angry than Democrats. And you can see that in the polling that talks about the enthusiasm gap. Uh, the enthusiasm gap, I, last I saw, of, I mean, several polls, but I think uh, Chuck Todd on NBC was talking about it, it was at 20%, which is pretty wide. Uh, it's the widest I've seen in a while. But, I mean, let's not just forget what happened in, in uh, last November. We're not talking about just Virginia or Republicans, you know, but you had a Democrat trifecta, a Democrat governor, Senate, and House. The Senate wasn't up. Uh, Republicans took the House of Representatives as well as the governor's race. But New Jersey, um, 
you had the Senate Majority Leader, who was a Democrat, who spent tons of money, the most powerful Democrat in the state Senate in New Jersey, get beat by a Republican that spent like $700. And he came out and said, look, this was just a wave. This was a wave election. There's nothing I could have done to win this. Win this. Um, I'll take him at his word. Uh, if you actually look at how close the governor's race results in New Jersey were, I think if Republicans would have been so focused on Virginia and been polling more in New Jersey, you would have seen a shift of a lot of national money towards New Jersey, realizing it was actually winnable when they didn't think it was winnable. And Chad, we had the same thing happen in an Oklahoma House race. Was that four years ago? <coughs> where the, the guy who had been designated to become the Democratic leader lost to someone who didn't campaign at all? At all. Uh, he wasn't even in the district on the night of the election. He said he's ever watching it. He was at a bar in Tulsa because he didn't think there was any way he was going to win. Yeah. And you had the opposite of that happen with <laughs> Kendra Horn and Steve Russell. I mean, Kendra Horn worked her butt off. I mean, yeah. there's just no other way to describe it. Absolutely. I mean, I live in her district, and I was contacted 10, 11, 12 times, um, all different ways, phone, Twitter, email, et cetera. Steve Russell, I was contacted once. Can I comment um, on that, too? Because you're right. And I say this all the time on my radio show, and I'm obviously a Republican, and my reality saw is a Republican. Um, Kendra Horn ran a phenomenal campaign when Absolutely. she beat Steve Russell. Um, we didn't go three weeks. We didn't get a th I'll, I'll get there. Okay. <laughs> we didn't go three weeks without getting a call from Kendra Horn across eight months wanting to come on our show. Mm -hmm. And so we brought her on, and I'm very civil on my show. I'm not a bomb thrower. I interviewed her, asked her questions, let her give her answers on the statement, and she was always gracious. Uh, she was an outstanding candidate. There's no question about it. And Steve Russell should be sued for political malpractice. <laughs> um, when you're an incumbent and you get beat by 3,500 votes and you've got $150,000 left in your bank account, and when our show contacted you in your press office at least seven times yeah. and you never even called us back, Kendra. You're not doing interviews. You're not talking to anybody that has conservative audiences or Republican audiences. And Kendra Horn's begging to get in front of the crowd. Uh, I think she ran a phenomenal campaign. Ward Curtin, actually, from Oklahoma, won National Campaign Manager of the Year for that. He's a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. When I was state chairman, he was the political director of the Democrat Party, and he earned that award. Uh, he was the National Campaign Manager of the She's Year. She's one of two people that did an interview with our organization. And when a when a, anybody in politics does an interview with my organization that's completely funded by a tribe, has no more than 7,000 readers. Um, and if you're a tribal citizen, you have, unless you're a tribal citizen, you really probably don't have any interest in my publication. But Kendra was one of the people who did an interview with ours. And I can personally attest to that. I was the youngest staffer on our campaign in 2018. So um, the amount of doors that I can say I personally knocked, I can say I probably did half of Oklahoma County all by myself. Um, but, I mean, the big thing with her was, you know, she, again, Chad said it, she ran a phenomenal campaign. A lot of the times, especially on the Democratic side, is people start way too late, mm -hmm. and then they don't actually put in the work to, put, to get it all the way across. She was already planning this way in advance, right? We're talking somebody playing like political 4D chess. Even before she decided she was gonna file and do all this sort of work, she was the executive director of Sally's List, and what did she do? She recruited a huge number of women to run on the under ballot, right? Because, and you know, you saw this with President Biden's election, even in places on the down ballot where people had lost, each and every single one of those votes put him over the top in order to make sure that states would flip. Um, so number one, you had amazing campaign coordination and candidates um, running for the first uh, running for office, right? Um, you had a lot of the suburbs, especially um, with college-educated women, like coming out in support of her, especially Republicans too. Um, but also, like you know, let's be honest, 2018 there was a Trump bump on top of that. Um, there was a lot of intact again. Who is the angriest, um, and who is going to be turning out? Well, you had Democrats and Republicans kind of turn out. And, and switch their votes. When we're talking about voter contact, right, you had somebody, like we had gone through and done multiple passes over the same people over and over and over again. 
Um, and it's expensive. These campaigns are expensive. There was, you know, I was waking up. I got up at 7 o'clock every day. Yes, the office hours say we start at 10, but really I was there at 8 o'clock and didn't leave until 11 p.m. Because for me, it was a vote for my life situation. We had to bring in constituencies that we never had brought in before to come out and campaign and talk about what's happening. Additionally, on top of that, you know, it costs a lot of money to run these campaigns. She raised close to, in 2018, I believe, like 1.2, between 1.2, 1.4 million. And then, you know, Bloomberg came in like, like at the very last moment with the $500,000 independent expenditure campaign, um, purchasing advertisements against Steve Russell. Did it help? Definitely. But I would like to say that half of those votes that we got, or at least that 0.7% that put it over the top, at least a little bit of that had to be mine. So, <laughs> um, but, but that's ultimately what it is. You, it is a contact campaign. It is a contact campaign that will put you over the top. While we're still on Kendra Horn, I do want to point out that she was the only candidate at Canada filing with her own entourage yesterday, signs included. Um, so she is already running for sure. Absolutely. All right. Dr. Farmer, did you have, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so there's a debate in political science about whether elections are sort of uh, predetermined mm -hmm. or if campaigns actually matter. And uh, the, the debate that says that they're predetermined is that there's some sort of a wave that's coming because people are mad at Biden, so they're all gonna vote Republican. Uh, the, the side that says that campaigns matter say that the things that these guys do uh, getting out and knocking doors, uh, direct mail to people's homes, that kind of stuff actually uh, determines the outcome of the election. And I think the answer is, uh, uh, is both of those things are true, mm -hmm. but where the wave comes into effect is it creates a, a margin. So let's suppose that the Republican wave is five points, which is gonna be more than five points. But let's suppose the, the, the wave is five points, and let's suppose that the Republicans do everything they can to campaign to get the, squeeze the most out of it, and the Democrats do everything that they can to squeeze the most out of it, then the end result is gonna be 5% better for Republicans in 2022 than it might have been in some other election because people are mad about inflation and, and all those things. And I, if you look at the election results on election night, you'll be able to see that a lot of the close races broke in one direction or the other direction, and that there's essentially some sort of a cushion or a wave that's in there. And that's what I anticipate is gonna, gonna come for the Republicans. Yeah, I would like to, I, I agree. It is both. Um, I've been doing campaigns since 1994, and I know what it's like when the wind's at my back, and I know what it's like when the wind's in my face making campaign decisions. And I can tell you, sometimes the wind is in your face so much, it doesn't matter how perfect you run your campaign, you just can't overcome it. There's sometimes the wind at your back so much, you couldn't screw it up enough to lose it. But there are also, not every election is a wave election. Right. We have what I would call more normal political atmospheres. And at that time, campaigns absolutely matter because uh, maybe when the wind's calm, it's going to be who's best at selling the ship. I still remember a candidate who you also know, um, who said to me, you know, if you're not willing to stand out on a street corner in the middle of the summer in Oklahoma with a sign that has your name on it all weekend long, you're not going to win a race. That was John Small ago. And, you know, that won him a couple races. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of politics is local, and contacting seems to be one of the biggest ways to overcome any kind of wave, um, particularly at the local level. You can do that with through contacting, through you know putting signage in people's mailboxes, through doing that type of stuff. Our last um, mm -hmm. chief election for the Muskogee Creek Nation looked like David and Goliath, literally with money. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Bruner had 150k. Um, which is, sounds like nothing compared to like what people are running, but to have $150,000 in the Muskogee Creek Nation's election was unheard of. Sure. Never, ever has it been done that way before. And he was one of the first ones, but his wife is, you know, very connected and has, you know, all the, all the strategies and they actually had campaign managers. They were doing everything they absolutely could. David Hill's final campaign reporting finances. I pulled those myself. I did that story. He had $27,000 that was raised from Indian taco sales and 
hundred dollar donations here and there yeah. and that's the way he won that election and it worked mm-hmm. Our elections really look like just an endurance gambit. Mm. And if you can show up and if you can still present Mm. and still maintain your integrity, by the end of it, you're solid. If you can't, because there's going to be a lot of mudslinging, there's going to be all the rumors come out. And if you don't survive that, well, how you conduct yourself in that environment is very important, especially in those indigenous communities still. Absolutely. Okay, so at the state level, continuing there, um, electoral politics have certainly shift and shifted in the last month. Uh, clearly, the announcement of Jen Inhofe's retirement uh, from the Senate triggering a special election uh, that we now know via executive uh, order is going to follow the same uh, general election schedule, um, so be on the same ballot, uh, general election ballot in November. Um, so how does that announcement um, uh, change Oklahoma politics, or does it change anything? Who do you think is going to win, Chad? Yeah, uh, I definitely yeah. want to know this. Um, you know, I, I'll answer that question, actually. I think, uh, I think it'll go to, obviously go to a runoff. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, it's likely. I mean, campaigns do matter, especially in primaries. They're very fluid, as you know. Yeah. But, I mean, if I was going to bet it today, I would bet that it would be Mark, Mark Wayne, Wayne Mullen and yep. T.W. Yep. Shannon in a runoff yep. because T.W. Shannon's already been on the ballot statewide. He got 40% in the Republican primary for the U.S. Senate against James Langford in 2014. So he already starts off with some statewide name ID. Mark Wayne has a congressional uh, district as a base. He already had money in his congressional account. Uh, I promise you T.W. Shannon won't be short on his ability to raise money. And so if I had to bet today, I think it'd be those two in the runoff, but uh, it's going to be competitive and campaigns matter. I mean, you can make mistakes and those types of things, but today I kind of see it that way. But yeah, it shook everything up. Uh, you have people that are leaving the House of Representatives to go run for the U.S. Congress mm-hmm. in the 2nd District right now. Right. Some are term limited, but some aren't. Um, and you're going to have, so that causes even more turnover down. And I'll kind of get into what Dr. Hart said later, because I do agree with this on politics being local. Mm-hmm. People sometimes underestimate the intelligence of voters. They can differentiate between a federal election and a state election on the same ballot. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because what's going on in Washington is going to have a lot more effect on those U.S. Senate votes and congressional seats than it will on state elections. Can I, you know, if you don't mind, I'd love to pick your brain to see how you think McGirt is going to be affecting a congressional district two election, yes. especially if it ends up going between T.W. Shannon and. Can Mark I preface Ryan. this real fast before we get into the, sure. the weeds here? Um, so, congressional district two is the seat that Mark Wayne Mullen uh, is vacating to run for in Hoff Senate seat, uh, and as of yesterday, you have eight uh, eight Republicans who have uh, filed for uh, congressional district two. So it is uh, including uh, the current uh, Republican chair, uh, party chairman uh, John Bennett as well as Dustin Roberts, who is no uh, stranger to uh, Oklahoma politics and uh, has definitely made a name for himself. And in full disclosure, yeah. uh, my wife and I are as general consultants, okay. Dustin Roberts. So just uh, it's out there. Uh, I do. I, we are working with Dustin Roberts. So. Okay, so please answer uh, this But for this, how it affects the second district, this is what's interesting it's because it's a Republican primary we're right. talking about. Um, while the governor has been saying a lot that McGirt's the most important issue in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. Um, I've seen three different polls in three different months from three different pollsters. When you ask Republican, likely primary voters, mm-hmm. what the most important issues are, well, McGirt's within the margin of error, not existing. It's mm-hmm. at three or four percent. Mm-hmm. Republican primary voters are not paying. I mean, yeah. that's mm-hmm. not on their radar. Can you be tied they're into back. Criminal justice? They're still. They're on inflation. They're. Yeah. I mean, they're living their pocketbook lives it's just like money. everybody. Yeah. Education and inflation. Jo- <laughs> inflation. Jobs yeah. and economy. What's going on at the border? Now that's what the border is a huge issue. Yeah. They're both. Oh, and but McGirt's when you never ask had McGirt, solid it's numbers. Yeah. at three or four percent with Republican primary voters. Mm. Interesting. No one's ever come out with those seventy-nine thousand numbers. No one's ever proven that. Yeah. So how can you look around your neighborhood every day and say that that thing the Supreme Court did about those imaginary lines that we can't even see is actually the most important thing for my life right now? That's just impossible to do. I don't care how much time you spend on Tucker Carlson. That's just not going to work. Touche. Did, was that an adequate answer? Oh, absolutely. Excellent. Any, um, so we think that Mark Wayne Mullen is going to go into the Senate then? Are we no, I think it'll be a runoff, runoff. between two. I think it's, this is, it's wide open, yeah, it's and wide it open. could be, and it, there's probably four candidates are going to have enough money that they're going to yeah. get messages out. Mm-hmm. I would just, one has a congressional district base that yeah. they represent. Right. The others already ran statewide and got 40% before, right. so that means 40% of the Republican electorate have already voted for them at one time. Right. 
So I would say they are the most two likely to make the runoff. So did Ted Cruz make a difference last night then with our friend who's running against? Uh, James Langford was going to win anyway. Yeah, that's just Fair enough. easy. Fair enough. <laughs> you know, all right, all right. I, um, I, so I would say. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and I don't think Kendra Horn can win statewide mm -hmm. in this election, not in this year. She's an incredible candidate. Uh, she did a great job of getting herself elected and beating Steve Russell, but she can't win this election. That's my take. I, I don't disagree. On the federal level, uh, with the president having a – I mean, if his numbers are bad nationally, but a 25 percent favorable in Oklahoma – you're very much swimming upstream in a federal election. If it was a state election, um, I think she could be a strong candidate in, in certain seats, yes. Um, so this is a question from uh, Professor Davenport. Uh, are any of you working for a particular candidate or a ballot issue? Uh, if so, whom or what? Briefly give us a platform speech. And so uh, Mr. Alexander's already disclosed you're working with. Uh, I'm doing general consulting with my wife on um, the uh, Dustin Roberts for U.S. Senate two, mm -hmm. and then uh, we're both general consulting April Grace for superintendent of schools, the current superintendent of Shawnee. Um, there are two different groups that have contacted me, but I have not had time. I mean, we're in filing week, okay. deadline week. I'm here, and I do radio for 46 for Monday through Friday. Um, so I haven't signed any agreements at this time. I haven't actually made a decision. Um, this is uh, probably the busiest week and the busiest year of my life every four years. Well, so. thank you for being here. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I can go ahead and follow up with that. Yeah, that's, that's, we're already pulling 12, 18-hour workdays now. Um, so for me, I've got a couple different folks. Uh, Shante Gilmore, who's running for House District 100 against Marilyn Stark, um, out over by you know Putnam City North in that council area. Uh, Christian Zapata in that primary Mary, formerly Representative Cruz's district in House District 89. Um, Gregory Harden, who's running in House District 26 against um, Del Curbs, the 7,000 vote margin. Uh, Janet McKinney, who's running for Tulsa uh, County uh, Commissioner in District 1. Um, Nicholas Singer, who's going to be running for Oklahoma County Assessor. Brandon Kirkpatrick of the Julius Jones Coalition, running for County Treasurer. And then we have, and then also on my ticket, Rand Eddy, who will be running for County Judge uh, against Stephanie Kirkpatrick here in Oklahoma County as well. And then also we're continuing to organize in Norman by creating the Norman Coordinated Campaign Committee um, just so that we can make sure that we do some protection for the folks down there. And I'll be working on some of the local elections, but I'm not even going to start going okay. down. And, and, and also, I wouldn't want to forget one or two. And right, absolutely. Yelled at later. <laughs> We're being, yes, it is being live streamed, I understand, and recorded. Um, wow, you've got quite a docket going. So. Not I'm enough consultants told. around. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so I want to, I do, I'm, since you uh, kind of picked on Mr. Alexander, I'm going to pick on you now. Uh, so I am. Desperately curious, and of course have been since uh, Hoffmeister changed her political affiliation, uh, if the Oklahoma Democratic Party is, is obviously uh, running a challenger, right, uh, in, in Connie Johnson, um, is the party backing one or the other, or? Well, as we know, the party cannot take an official stance and endorsing in primaries, but mm -hmm. you know, the second that Joy Hoffmeister decides to join the Democratic primary and put out a press release welcoming Joy Hoffmeister to the party, I mean, you know, behavior speaks louder than words, in my opinion. Um, and on top of which, I mean, if you, it's, it's, this is, this is an easy primary for her. I mean, to be very honest with you, I think one of the smartest things that she did was leave the Republican primary because she knows she wouldn't have won a gubernatorial primary against Kevin Stitt, um, and you know, decided to join ours because she knows she can beat anybody in ours. Whether or not, I mean, and you know, I mean, I'll just be honest with you. You take a look at her policies, and I mean, she's specifically talking about healthcare, education, and rural broadband. S same thing we spoke about in 2018, but not with enough hype. Um, and then the other thing, too, is, and I'll say this, is while the party doesn't necessarily take sides, people do. Um, and your party is composed of people. Right. And it seems very clear and evident to me what the internal politics look like. You know, whenever uh, one of our national committee members directly recruits out of the Republican Party to find someone to run in our primary, it speaks a lot of words that we couldn't even find somebody within our own party to run on the gubernatorial ticket. Why? Because nobody know. Because everybody realizes that they're not going to win. Um, you know. Good friend down at the end of the line here said, "Was Kendra Horde have a chance at winning at the U.S. Senate level? 
brutally honest truth, it's gonna, you need a, a miracle, a mountain. You have to move a mountain, right? Redistricting has ensured that Congressional District 5 stays in the hands of Republicans for the next decade. Right? That's why I'm no longer interested in running any federal races. I'm interested in taking local bit by bit by bit because this is a long-term game for the rest of us to be able to play. You know, I would really hope, I would really, really, really hope that um, we do a little bit better than Drew Edmondson did. You know, he clocked in at 40.8%, spent about $4 million and $2 million in independent expenditure money. Um, but I personally predict that Joy Hoffmeister will either around, like, will either place around the same area, if not below, um, between 36 and 39%. Um, I would love to see how Kendra does as well, because to be honest, we haven't actually ever had a solid, competent uh, Democratic candidate run for U.S. Senate in a long time. Um, so I'm not going to make a prediction on that one. I would hope she gets to 42%, but that's asking for a lot. Where's Joe Dorman when the Democrats need him? Huh. <laughs> I, I actually, I, I, I'll throw into this. I would not have said this three weeks ago. Yeah. Um, but I will say, uh, Drew Edmondson had a lot going for him baggage-wise yeah. that Joy didn't. And what I mean by that is just two years earlier, he had ran the campaign that PETA backed on yeah. the right to farm. Mm -hmm. That crushed him in western Oklahoma with farmers and cattle people. Um, Joy does not have that baggage. And also, when you get to rural Oklahoma, if you look at the governor's race in 2018, uh, the governor lost Oklahoma County, lost Cleveland County by 3,500 votes. He won Tulsa by about 3,500 votes. So your three largest counties um, were kind of neutralized. And the reason I said I wouldn't say this three weeks ago and nothing actually may come of this, but right now we do know there's a grand jury into the appointments of the pardon parole. Right. We do know after, and this was the one, the last loft meeting mm -hmm. with the Swally Soggy bombs across the state, and then uh, David Prater calling on the OSBI to investigate. Mm -hmm. Now, now that may have come of any of those things, so there's, a, and, and I don't know that anything will, sure. but the one thing that can make people cross party lines is if they think they see uh, corruption here, corruption there. Even the governor doesn't know anything about it. If you're, you're the one that appointed this person, you're the one that appointed this person, you hired this person, you know, if, those, if you have indictments start coming down, which I'm not saying they will, right, right. I'm just throwing a hypothetical out there, that I, that's the one thing that I think can break ideological lines. Mm -hmm. um, I'm saying I think it's a real long shot, right. but if you wanted to pick, if you had, we had a dark horse question on there, yeah. mm -hmm. um, she has won statewide twice, right. and then you do have a, 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 a issue if, if it looks like you have a lot of people that you hired that get in trouble, whether you know anything about it or not. Yeah. Do you and think I, those I, oh, three dark horse races, or excuse me, ads on the right would have an impact on the race? I mean, I think uh, where they go, I mean, I do think that you saw the governor go up, as Dr. Farmer mentioned. I mean, I think uh, his favorability started to take a hit. I mean, I don't think it's in a place right now where he's in any, any danger. Mm -hmm. um, but as that evolves yeah. and, and, and builds negatives, could it have an impact? It, sure it could. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about, uh, you know, comparison ads, negative ads, however you want to call them, is um, people ask me all the time, we hate seeing all these negative ads. And this is my radio show, people call it, and I give them the same answer. Mm -hmm. As soon as you quit choosing who you're going to vote for when we run them, we'll quit running them. Absolutely. But work. when it takes me a million dollars statewide to get my candidate up to 58% favorability, mm -hmm. but with $300,000, I can bring your negatives up 20 points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper to we'll be quit, negative. We'll quit running <laughs> yeah. them when they quit working. Exactly. But also, they have to be done right. There is an art to it. Even if, something's tr even if it's true, if voters don't believe it, mm -hmm. it'll backfire. Um, if they're drunk in the wrong way, they'll backfire. If you remember the last gubernatorial election in the runoff, mm -hmm. uh, the Mick Cornette campaign yeah. ran the yeah. bull stit acts. Yeah. <laughs> and to me, that know. seemed like a bunch of younger political operatives that thought they came up with a really cute idea, not realizing the majority of runoff voters in Oklahoma's age yep. Yep. <laughs> and their religious affiliation mm -hmm. that did not find them cute at all. And you saw that in the results of the runoff. Yeah, I think so. I, I also think that uh, 
there's an oversaturation point. You don't see this very often, but as much money as is going to be spent against Governor Stitt in uh, independent expenditures, there's a point at which voters tune out. They're like, I've heard enough, don't tell me anymore. And in fact, at that point, these negative ads could start to backfire. Uh, that very rarely happens. Negative advertising works. Getting your voters angry is part of how you win. You can create negatives a lot faster than you can create positives. I, I have told many classrooms full of students, negative advertising is the only way you're going to win. I've told candidates that face to face on the on the couch. Um, but I do believe that there's an oversaturation point, and if they spend $10, $15 million in independent expenditures, basically pounding the same two or three messages, mm -hmm. people are gonna get, be like, I heard that already, I'm done with that. And I think that could happen in this race. Yeah, I think with the money, there's always a kind of a mm -hmm. point of diminishing returns. You remember John Ossoff when he ran a special yes. for Congress? Mm -hmm. Or how about Beto O'Rourke and how much he had against yes. Ted Cruz? You get, in a, you get to a point of money mm -hmm where it's there, and I would agree with Dr. Farmer on that. I mean, I think if you're gonna run on the set, this, all this money on the same issue, you're gonna get, over, so it goes away. Um, you know, do they diversify, do they come with better issues? I don't know, uh, those are all hypotheticals, but there is a point of diminishing a turn on money. There's only so many voters and so, I mean, how much did Susan Collins have in Maine last time, and that was how much per voter? I mean, it was a point of diminishing return. Sure, absolutely. Tons, how do you handle uh, negative campaigning or ads, do you? We, you know, over on the Democratic Party side, we really don't do a lot of negative campaigning. You just blow stuff up on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. That's what, well, hold on. Game that's, plan. What, that's what progressives do. Oh, um, got it, got it. Um, like, well, Nuances. Well, because it's, I mean, for us, it's always been about punching up. Right. We've always had to punch up whenever it comes to campaigning on that sort of regard, and because the other thing is, is we're too afraid to offend anybody. Um, I mean, my motto is now in politics is I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to win, and it just so happens that my policies benefit you. You may not like it. Uh, I mean, but beca because you know we have to get down in sure. the mud. <laughs> like as far as like you know, we're I'll say this, but we don't f like we're afraid to fight. And I'm not, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm not afraid to fight. Mm -hmm. um, that's how you make something out of nothing. Um, that's how you end up ensuring you get creative because once you actually get in the fight, it makes you look, somebody take, will take you seriously then. Yeah. You see a lot of that uh, hesitancy to really scrap it out in, in indigenous politics as well. Mm -hmm. If you look at those, while they can be completely and utterly, you know, horrible in some ways, there is often an air of, we don't want to see conduct of our leaders that makes them look like they, you know, have no dignity or don't have the grace to win in an appropriate or good way. And so you see that negative campaigning is almost a death sentence in indigenous uh, elections. Steve Bruner started running David Hill's laundry and it affected him really, really badly because they said, is this the guy that we want to lead our nation to go and be the ambassador to the state of Oklahoma and to the federal government? That can be very harmful. And then also tribes can be very strange. And the fact that Oklahoma has 39 federally recognized ones, we don't care about your parties. I don't care about party and I'll never really care about party. Okay. We're still waiting for the indigenous leadership to step up to those levels who's not for sale. And so until we have that, um, we just don't really care. And we are looking at your record and what you've done and how you've conducted your business with the tribes. And right now the tribes are doing a lot of really loose organizing amongst the citizens. They are very, you won't see the leadership come out and talk about who they want to see in there, but the citizens are very involved. And now you can almost not have a press conference in the 918 with the governor without the indigenous people showing up in mass and he can tell you that they're bust in from out of state but that isn't true i know them they're my aunties and they sat beside mm -hmm. me and and we together so that's going on and it's it's i don't know that it will ever have an enormous impact on the state of oklahoma but i think that oklahoma is indigenizing in a way that it hasn't before mm. I wanted to also kind of add, I mean, you know, you said this is your aunties and your uncles and stuff like that. This, this state's only 4 million people, which means everybody knows somebody at some point. And that's also why over on our team, we're so afraid to piss somebody off <laughs> is because, oh man, if this person's getting mad at me, then this person's also going to get mad at me. In two weeks, it's not going to matter. 
Like, frankly, it's really not. Um, unless you're one of those people that, like, likes to hold a grudge. Um, and there's also another saying that, you know, Republicans, like, fall in love and Democrats fall in love. And I'm just like, mm, I'm on the left. We also, like, need to learn how to fall in line. If you want to be able to have uh, win elections, you need to be well organized and disciplined like a military. You know, um, we all care about the same things. It's just we frame it differently. Some people call it accountability. Some people call it authority. Right. And it's about what messaging is going to end up working with that community. You look at the base of the Democratic Party, and to be completely honest with you, we make no freaking sense. Uh, you have black moderates over on this side, and then you have far leftists over on that side, who you also have, like, the LGBTQ community. Like, for us, it's always how do we find, like, a common thread between all of them? And, you know, I mean, you saw it with Obama. He promised change, right? And that was, like, the big aggregate thing that everybody just fell in love with. It was change. Um, and to be honest with you, I think, especially here in Oklahoma, I'd love to see a couple more tougher tactics being used on our side, more aggressive, more progressive. You also have to define change if you're going to advocate for it. Um, we've kind of run through our questions quite quickly. Um, so I'm going to ask one final question and then open it up to the audience, because I'm sure we have a few uh, who have something to say. Um, so if someone were to approach you to seek advice on running for office in Oklahoma, uh, what are the most important considerations that they need to think about? I'll start with Dr. Hart. Well, my pet peeve about elections in Oklahoma is the fact that there are so many seats that remain uncontested. Yes. Um, we've had elections in, at the state legislative level, House, Senate, where sometimes it's 60, 70 percent. Um, either don't face a opponent in the primary, don't face opponent in the general, and that is a trend that's actually occurring not just in Oklahoma, it's also occurring nationally. Um, there are very few, um, the, this year was the, uh, 2020 was the lowest number of crossover districts where Biden people voted for Trump or Trump people voted for Biden. Um, and so there were only 16 um, crossover districts where the candidate actually won. Um, and so that was, what you're seeing is I want to seek as many possible avenues of recruitment. Yes. Um, and so I've seen various groups across Oklahoma try to recruit candidates. Mm -hmm. I always tell a student, if you decide to run, I will support you. I will give you your first, I'm not rich, your first $25. <laughs> so that's my first contribution. And so I have done that um, because I want to see as Republican, Democrat, independent, whatever. I want to see as many candidates running as possible because you can't have a race if you only have one candidate. Having more candidates also drives a voter turnout. Yes. Um, for me, um, it's a balance between the data and the story, right? Um, if, you know, if I'm looking at a district like, you know, Hass District 88, which I know is more of a safe Democratic district than anything, then for me, I want to see how do we make that district more bluer? Mm -hmm. And also, who is it, right? Um, you know, there's one thing in activism that we talk about is, you know, they can take away your money, they can take everything away from you, but they can't take away your story. Ever, the most expensive thing that we have that we hold to ourselves is our story and who can articulate that story the best. Mm -hmm. um, for me, whenever I sit down with a candidate, you know, I ask them, okay, number one, who are you? What do you represent, right? Because those issues that you bring to the table, you are the messenger. You are the business when you run for office. The product, if it's good, will sell itself. And so if, and if you're not up to par, you're not going to be a good product. As far as I'm concerned, I have to see, you know, the other thing too is time right? Um, raising money and knocking doors takes a lot of time. If there's one thing that I have my candidates do all the time is like, I would rather you raise money rather than go knock a door because guess what? When you're going to go knock a door, somebody's auntie or uncle is going to sit you down for 30 minutes and be asked you about literally your entire life story and everything. But if you're just a door knocker, they're going to want to talk to you for like five minutes normally. And for me, like, you know, that's whenever candidate door knocking, at least in larger elections in particular, hits a wall. It's different whenever you're running in, say, for example, Shawnee with Greg, right? That's 7,000 votes, right? Between now and November, you should be able to hit 7,000, right? So for me, it really does come down to, like, what's your story? What are the issues that you're running on? And what is what does your capital look like? Is it more financial capital? Is it more social capital? Those are the three things that I'm looking for whenever I'm looking at a candidate. 
I guess for me, if I'm like looking at some, someone saying, oh, I'm going to run for office, and I just want to know that the person, regardless of party, regardless of their policy that they've chosen to run on, is to have something that you actually are running on and not to be just one of these people who, um, well, I've been a county commissioner and my next step up is. Mm-hmm. I'm just kind of sick of that. And then I also want people to understand that you go into anything, and I don't care if it's politics or if it's your first job, um, don't measure your worth on that first year. I mean, how long does it honestly take a person who's entered into, you know, this realm to actually get their bearings? Like, be ready to, and rooted into this and ready to do it for a while because we need people to get in there, acclimatize, form networks, get things done. And I don't think that we have enough of that stick with it that we used to have in, in our leadership yeah. today. Like, it's it's new faces and it's new ideas, but it's flashy and it's... Um, a Twitter campaign and then it's gone and it flashed and we've forgotten it and so I really want someone who is like those names that I grew up with who my parents knew and who I heard talking about someone who embodies that so I know that there's leadership in, in, enshrined in that person uh, first question I would ever ask is why do you want to run why do you want the job what are you trying to do and then um, there's times that Literally, I've not taken candidates as a consultant because of the answer. And then there's times where you have a couple of candidates are getting a race and you got your choice. Mm-hmm. And who answers that question the best and with most passion is, is who I'm going with. Mm-hmm. And I would say, and I'll use Steve Large as an example. Sure. Um, I think Steve Large wanted to be governor. Mm-hmm. I don't think he wanted to govern. Yeah. I think that sometimes you have people that want the title but not necessarily want the job. Sure. And as the representative could tell you right now, they don't get paid a lot of money to be state legislators. <laughs> it's very thankless. You're going to hear a lot more from the people mad at you mm-hmm. than are happy with you. And the environment has changed so much. Um, I think back to when I was at college, um, I dated when, when, when I was at UCO and, and Dr. Arbus, one of my professors, I dated a very liberal Democrat female. Mm-hmm. Um, I, from my son that's in college, and my daughter that's in high school, but, you know, now people are figuring out someone's political affiliation for they had dated them or not. People's political affiliation was the last thing on my mind before I asked out a uh, well, young woman when I was in college. I mean, it's her values. Uh, so, so because of that, and that's why I ask them, why do you want it? Because it's become so polarized. Mm-hmm. People that may like you, as soon as they see that letter behind your name, may decide they don't like you anymore. And that's changed a lot. So you got to be personally willing to take it. It's not personally financially beneficial. And you're going to get a lot more criticism than you do praise. And so why do you want the job? Yeah. Lots of great hair. Same can, can I ask what would make you not? What's an answer that would make you not take the candidate on? I think a great thing was, was something she mentioned. Well, if I win this, I can run for that. Okay. okay so you're talking, telling me you want the job you're running for. Yeah. You're telling me what job you want yeah. after gotcha. you get the job you're running for. Okay. And can I go to the restroom real quick? Oh, yes, Thank okay. you. Yes, please. <laughs> Dr. Farmer. Uh, I think campaigns are about a message, a messenger, and the resources to deliver that message. Mm-hmm. And so the question that, that I ask is, what are some core principles that you're not willing to compromise on? And then the follow-up question to that is, are you a good fit for this district? Mm-hmm. Because You're asking people, let me represent you. Well, you better be representative of them. So if you're a person of principle and you're not willing to compromise, then you better fit the district or this isn't going to work out. And so then the the next question is, okay, where are the resources going to come from? So do you you have the ability to raise the money? Do you have friends who can help you? Uh, Campaigns have become very professionalized and very expensive. Even legislative races, have, um, even mayor's race in, in Norman. Mm-hmm. I mean, these things have become uh, very professionalized, very expensive. Door knockers used to be volunteers. Now, door knockers are people who get paid, which, by the way, you guys can make some good money knocking doors in the next few months. I told you. Uh, if, if you want to if you want to knock doors for Republicans, talk to Chad. You want to knock doors for Democrats, talk to Taz. Taz. But um, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, but it's, it's become very expensive, and the idea that uh, you and a few friends are going to put together some flyers and, and uh, go out and get yourself elected 
is probably pretty far-fetched. So, you know, what are your core principles? Are you a good fit for the district? And where are the resources going to come from? Yep. Those would be the questions. Excellent. Well, let's give our panel, uh, minus Ms. Brown, Ms. Anker, who will be back in a minute. <laughs> a round of applause. We'll applaud him while he's gone. All right. <laughs> All right, I will open it up to questions from the audience. I'm sure at least Davenport has one. Nobody? Don't be afraid. <laughs> Yes. Yes. I think I know where Chad's going to go with this, so I'll start. I think it's about a message, a messenger, and the resources to deliver the message. And that might be a really good message. Uh, the independent expenditures are not something that a candidate can control, but it delivers that message. But I'm not sure any of the people that you've mentioned are the messenger. And uh, uh, I, I worked with Joel Kinsel for a number of years at the House of Representatives. He is a rock solid guy. He, uh, I, I can't imagine someone else that I would put more confidence in than him, yeah. but he's just not a known quantity. Yeah. And it's gonna be very difficult for him to become a known quantity in a month and a half. I mean, if Joel was gonna run for governor, he should have told us this a year ago. Yeah. And I so uh, I, I think what would be missing in that equation could be the messenger. Uh, and uh, Governor Stitt still, polls uh, very very popular um, very highly and I just think it's a long way to go in a couple months that man's gonna win a primary hands down <laughs> the IEs I mean for me I mean the way that I perceive the IEs are just to make sure that he stays on top of the issues that's it and you know issues will help push people out it's hard to think that you can uh, go out and talk about a message of fixing justice which is what the governor's done right he's saying that justice is this big important thing we need to fix in our state and then any amount of money put against that message how can that be effective like everyone wants to say stay safe so I mean he's kind of got that like no matter what you say it's kind of like you're criticizing for no reason if you attack him on you know any of his McGirt stuff and everything like that. He doesn't really suffer. He just kind of goes out and throws a barbecue and says, look at them, you know, Literally. striving for their rights against me when I'm just <laughs> striving for your rights, you know? And so nothing's really effective against that except the understanding of the real system and the real context, which we will never drill a hundred years of history and, and understanding into people in the state. Many of them don't even realize why and how they became to be here in the first place. And so that's, that's something that I don't think any amount of money can fix or dissuade from. So all he has to do is stay on message, keep appearing on Tucker and he's good. I mean, that's it. Like just not at CPAC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think there's, kind of a multi-factor hypothetical that we don't know the answers to yet. Um, we've heard speculation about how much money is going to be spent from these three different groups, but we don't know exactly how much money is going to be spent from these three different groups. We don't know what messages they're going to use. Um, like I said, I, uh, if I were to get in the governor's strategy team, I would be a little bit concerned after the loft meeting about some of the things that come out um, about some of the spending uh, that happened there and maybe like I said because if you have a part in parole board grand jury investigation maybe nothing comes of it um, I don't know anything that you guys don't know 
but when the DA asked the OSBI to investigate how state money was spent at the tourism facilities for a restaurant and the budget going from 2.7 to 16.7, I think is what came out at Loft, and there's an investigation there. I think if you start seeing, especially with conservatives, if they, if they start seeing a mismanagement of money or you know, type of indictments of people that are hired that are in the executive branch or hired by the government, you know, those type of things. I mean, it's kind of a mixture of just different, if there's a negative tone out there. Um, but like I said, I don't know anything. You don't know. It could be absolutely nothing ever comes of it. And, you know, they may run ads that just quite frankly aren't effective or there may be an issue pop up that can be used. I mean, anything could happen when millions of dollars are going for flowing around. But I mean, I think he's the odds on favor to be fine. I, I, would, I do want to add, um, I'm not going to lie. I am kind of like from like a media perspective, I am actually quite a big fan of like Republican messaging because like it's so simple. It's sweet. Like it's like right to work. Sounds amazing. Right to farm. Sounds great. Like just sell freedom. It's it's all yeah. You're selling freedom yeah. to people because that's what this this country like loves to pride itself on is the freedom. The real question is freedom from what? Like that's and you know again it's the conversation on definition. But I mean Oklahoma is a very populous state. If there's something that the left doesn't really know how to do is understand populism <laughs> to a degree. Um, and when we get a when we and again this is something that happens more in progressive terms. That's really easy for whenever like somebody on the right can claim that like we're elitist because we sound bad on it. So. I mean, I think what you saw with the NCAA this year with women swimming, I mean, I, doing the radio show and going through the news, scrolling for stuff to talk about every day, literally, in almost every publication, Leah Thomas became, you know, the people paying attention to politics became very well known on the fact that uh, competing as a male the first three years of college uh, ranked like the 467th swimmer in the country, and then this year was the number one ranked swimmer in the country and broke the NCAA record, the 500 meter. Um, and that probably that put a national spotlight on it, and I think that's why you saw a lot of those bills in a lot of states. As Oklahoma was one of like 16 um, that have done that. Uh, you know, Florida did it, Texas did it. That kind of propelled that issue. Um, you know, to a lot of people, this most recent abortion bill that passed uh, that we were talking about yesterday that only has a restriction uh, for the emergency situation of the life of the mother. Even with my call in radio audience, um, they're pretty divided on that. That's not, uh, they're, they're pretty divided on how they feel about that. You have the abolitionists that are 100% for it, but you have a lot of people that think, well, they, they bring up different scenarios and, and things. Um, I mean, if you look at Reagan's position on abortion, you know, endangerment the life of the mother, rape, incest. So like I said, Reagan's platform couldn't pass with a lot of the pro-life activists of today. They would reject Reagan on that. Um, so I do think, uh, I mean, you know, strategy wise, how people want to do things, they can do things, but I do think, or I know when you pull the top issues, state of Oklahoma, you're going to see inflation, education, inflation, bread and butter, checkbook issues. Um, whether it's guns, whether it's abortion, whether it's social issues, they come in in the single digits. That doesn't mean that they're not passionate, that those people aren't passionate about those issues and their core, um, but I think this year, I mean, we've seen the worst inflation we have in, what, 41 years? If you're not focusing on something as the worst as it's been in 41 years, I think you're missing the boat. If you're not focusing on um, the jobs and the economy, and if you're, especially if you're, probably, if you're not talking about what's going on at the border, 
the leading cause of death of 18 to 45 year olds in the United States last year was fentanyl overdose. Uh, most, a lot of it's manufactured in China, but it's coming through our southern border, and people are paying attention to that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So, um, we just went through an exercise where the legislature pulled out of Sharpies and we all got to draw our own districts. And you know, what's surprising to me as a political neophyte, you guys are all far more experienced than I am politically, uh, was the rise of a number of primary opponents for my Republican colleagues who perhaps unintentionally drew a district that was more partisan. You know, that's not, <clears throat> I wouldn't totally write it up to redistricting. Um, I've been in politics in Oklahoma since 1994, and there were three incumbents that had lost primaries before 2016. Yeah, it was uh, uh, Jason Murphy took out an incumbent in the primary, Wayne Pettigrew lost, and there was one other. So from 1994, when I got in in 2016, only three Republicans had lost primaries in the state legislature. Then we had a year where you had three Republicans lose that year, or five, three or four. And then the next year, between runoffs and primaries and runoffs, it was like 10. So, I mean, you've got more in one cycle than we had in two and a half decades. Um, and I think that, sh that shows you, as Republicans have had about 52% of the vote now, registered voters in Oklahoma. When I started, Democrats had a huge majority. Um, and I think they're doing a smart thing, actually, by focusing on local areas they can win because that's what Found Holland and I and Trevor Worthy and the other consultants did. We went out and won us a bunch of state legislative seats, so we had a deep bench. The Democrats don't have much of a bench right now, and they, and they need it. So what you're seeing is in Republican districts then, um, you have the, and I mean, I, I hate the term rhino. I mean, it's like, okay, now we have a litmus test. If you don't agree with me on 100% of the issues, you're not a Republican, even if we agree 80, 20, 85, 15. Um, and so I think you have an element in the Republican Party that you have to be right here on everything. And then I think you have a more practical governing Republican Party. And I think you see a fight there. But I think nationally, on the national stage, you kind of see a civil war with the Democrats between the moderates and the progressives in the primary. So they're kind of having it on a national basis. And I just use that because it helps people understand what I'm talking about on a state and local basis with what's going on with Republicans. Uh, I, I would agree with that. I, I wouldn't look to redistricting as a reason for primaries as much as, um, you know, as much as we'd like to say that we hate political parties, actually they're inevitable. And they're inevitable because we have differences of opinion. And then that aggregates into factions. And when the Democratic Party is as small as it is as a representative base, I mean, as a voting base, it's bigger than it is as a, rep as a representative base. But when, when you only have eight senators or you only have 19 House members, then the Republicans are gonna, gonna faction. And then you're gonna have primaries between these Republican factions. That, that's what I think is going on. I, I did wanna mention on redistricting, um, uh, early on Dr. Hart said that she thought um, nationwide redistricting might benefit the Democrats by three or four seats. Uh, I've talked to some folks, multiple folks in DC who on the Republican side think that nationally congressional redistricting is gonna be a net zero. So I've heard Republicans say, we've drawn those lines and so we're gonna win, right? And the answer is, well, it's probably gonna be a net zero. I've heard that from several Republican people nationwide. And you've actually seen challenges. I think the redistricting process this time around was much more challenging. First of all, the states got the ability to redistrict late um, because of COVID, because of census issues. And so you're seeing, at least in three states, um, where Republicans haven't even done their maps yet. Um, Florida, for example, there's a fight between the Florida Republican legislature and the Florida Republican governor, and so the Republican legislature just put it into the governor's lap. Uh, and in Missouri, you're seeing a fight between the Missouri House and the Missouri Senate, 
and now it's gotten to the point where those maps have been done after the filing deadline. So now you've got candidates who are running for seats that are not going to exist in November, um, which is obviously a, a challenge. Um, and then you've got New Hampshire as well, where you've got the Governor Sununu going against a Republican legislature. That's going down to a fight. And part of the issue is, in some cases, like with Sununu, it was strange because he would actually wanted to have two districts that were both partisan. Um, that's what, I mean, sorry, that's what the re, uh, Republican legislature wanted. They wanted two districts that were basically um, one Republican, one Democrat. Mm -hmm. And Sununu said, no, this is a purple state in New Hampshire, and he's a Republican. This is a purple state in New Hampshire. So both districts need to be competitive. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it's always been, and that's the way it should be in a purple state. And so you're seeing varying reasons um, in Florida. DeSantis <coughs> honestly wants to district um, several black representatives out of their seats. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. Jacksonville, I mean, that's where it's happening. Um, and he wants to district them out of their seats. And so um, it's happening for all sorts of reasons, but I think you're seeing success by people like Democracy Docket, um, if you're not familiar with that group. Um, but other organizations fight some of these redistricting plans. Um, they've lost in Maryland, they've lost in New York, <laughs> but they've won in North Carolina, they've won in Ohio, they've won in a couple other places. And so you're seeing a kind of a mix. I think redistricting will have more of an effect probably in 2024 than 2022. Mm -hmm. um, because I think uh, if you're in a Biden plus 10 district or less, you're not safe this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you. And I think we should like watch those court cases that are coming out with the voter access for reservations because those are kicking up and people are fed up with being locked out of those. Yeah. I was going to say, I think voter disenfranchisement and voter access is going to become one of the hugest issues going over mm -hmm. the next decade. I mean, truth be told, y'all, if you can file your taxes with the IRS online, you should be able to vote the same way too. <laughs> we can, we can make it, we can make it as easy as we decide to and you should not have to produce the form of id that you used 40 years ago when you first registered to vote which is now being done if in we texas move to voting online there will be no faith in the elections <laughs> we can't keep the nsa from being hacked by the countries you think everybody's going to believe we have a cyber proof hacking online vote there's no i mean i don't you I trust don't the media countries more than i do <laughs> Uh, that's interesting that you guys brought up kind of voter disenfranchisement. I had a, uh, a question that we didn't get to. Um, HJR 1059 and uh, House Bill 3232 both um, passed out. They're now on the full Senate floor uh, to be heard. Uh, 3232 uh, states that for any federal law, law regulation or any other uh, official action that seeks to, quote, uh, substantially modify or supersede any state voter registration or election laws, those changes are only applicable to federal elections in the state. Uh, and then HJR 1059, uh, this one I think is the more problematic one that will likely pass, uh, requires at least 55% of the vote for the uh, four state questions uh, amending the Constitution to pass. So that's, that's a it's, it's, kick. it's all about finding out how to make the game harder or easier. Yeah. Like literally, if you control the game board in itself, then you've made it in your favor. Are we seeing this on the very, very micro level throughout the last three or four years of the tribe is that we have people who are shifting this paradigm and who want to retain power and we have people who want access desperately and and for the tribe there's a lot of different things that affect your ability to access such as blood quantum and all these types of things but what you actually have happening when people start altering that that framework too much it causes a lot of you know, big scaries and people back back down from that. You know, we we don't like that, you know, in terms of continuity and for thinking generations ahead. We want this process to remain accessible. So right now as a tribal citizen, I feel like I have way more of an impact on my tribal nation than I will ever have on my state with my vote. And that's an important Thing that people are starting to realize as tribal citizens. So I wouldn't be surprised if more people start paying attention at least to framework altering legislation and stuff like that and thinking about it in those terms. It's become very prevalent in our community um, and which made it 
nearly and virtually impossible for me to pass a ballot re referendum, which but we did, and we did it with almost 80 percent, you know, support. So, but it was it was 14 years of my life, you know, like door knocking and talking with people and telling my story to get that to happen. So I hope that those framework type altering things don't change the access because about the time I learned how to work that system, it started changing on me. And that's what made it take 14 years yeah. to get free press. You know, like that was just the problem with that. If we see the signature uh, law go into play, you will never ever see something as transformative as medical marijuana or healthcare expansion ever again. It'll be I do. I not support. I do not support moving it to 55 yeah. percent. I, I reserve the right to think independently. I, I think, uh, as with my political science background and my election background, 50 plus one is all you need. Yep. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. This, 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 so, that's bipartisan right here, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Across the board. So I actually wrote a paper about this uh, some years ago. Uh, a professor that I had in college. And I wrote a paper together, which I'm really proud to say now that he's passed away. So I encourage you guys to do that. Find something that would be interesting that maybe you could write with your professor. Uh, but we wrote a paper about initiative and, re and referendum in Oklahoma. And uh, before 1974, in order for a state question to pass in Oklahoma, it had to get 50% of the top of the ticket vote. So there's a, there's a ballot drop off, people vote for governor, they vote for president, but then they don't really know who those people are running for county assessor, so they just skip it. And then they get down to the state questions, and they're like, I don't know what any of these are about, and they skip them. Well, that was called the silent vote, and that was counted as a no. It wasn't actually counted, mm -hmm. but you had to get 50% of the top of the ticket vote, so it, not voting essentially was a no. Hmm. And I point that out for this reason. So it's not 55%, but it is a higher than majority. So initiative petitions in Oklahoma uh, from 1907 to 1974, 50% um, of those would have been passed by the people were it not for this higher requirement. Mm -hmm. But because of the higher requirement, only 34% passed. So that's actually like 40% of the ones that would have passed mm -hmm. didn't pass because there was a supermajority requirement. Mm -hmm. And then for things that came from the legislature, so, so it actually turns out that initiative petitions are less successful on the ballot than proposals that come from the legislature, just generally speaking. But for um, issues that came from the legislature, 62% of them would have passed if it weren't for the supermajority requirement, but because of the supermajority requirement, only 55% passed. So again, they were more successful, but there were a number of issues that were knocked down when we had that supermajority. And I agree that um, rules make a difference and rules determine a, a lot about the power relationship and partisans on both sides fight over the rules because they make a difference. Absolutely. Um, I would have something to say about uh, voter integrity too, but maybe I've said enough for the moment. Oh. <laughs> cool. we are, we're all ears, Dr. Farmer. Uh, any other questions, Karen, that you have bullet um, points? Yeah. Are they like a coherent question or just bullet points? <coughs> She's my student, don't worry. I appreciate okay, it. Do you want a question? Well, I, have, I have a decent amount. Uh, well, yeah, how, how about you pick your best one?
Mm. So go ahead. No, go ahead. I don't I'll believe that it changes unless the people who run really work into the silo and fix the issue in implementation. And that's any problem ever. So incarceration of women in Oklahoma is insane. What are the socioeconomic fallouts of that? Think about what's happening in those homes and what that's spiraling to create. So you want to drill down into the silo, the silo and actually fix a problem. It's more than just getting any party elected. It's, it's the commitment and the due diligence and the work to, to fix that issue you know, on the ground. Because those guys in office... They put out frameworks and then implementation. And if you look at like things going on in our state right now, there's plenty of frameworks already in place, but there's disconnection between implementation. And so that's the problem. And I point out in, in, in Oklahoma, we have a, you have a substantial number of Republicans that are for criminal justice reform. I'm, I'm one of them. We have right on crime. Uh, I sit on the Oklahoma County Jail Trust. Mm -hmm. I know the problems that we took over when that building was there, what we've had to fix. And the fact is, it should have never been 13 floors. You shouldn't have that few el working elevators on the secure side uh, on 13 floors. That causes a tremendous amount of, there, well, I could talk about that, all day, but there are a lot of conservatives and Republicans. We have bills moving through the legislature right now. Uh, State Representative Nicole Miller, uh, House District 182 in Edmond, um, she has a bill for automatic expungements because right now there's a lot of people that don't even realize they're eligible for an expungement. And if they are, they have to go hire an attorney that's going to charge them a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars to get expunged. That would set an automatic expungement as soon as they're eligible. It would be, it would expunge their record, um, and they wouldn't have to get an attorney. And that would be. And we've got I think five other reform bills that are going through uh, limiting the number of things a driver's license could be suspended for. Because right now, damn near anything will get your driver's license suspended, no matter That's what it has anything to do with driving. <laughs> Um, how are you supposed to get to work? How are you supposed to pay your taxes? How are you supposed to pay a ticket? You can't. Um, and so that's where it gets way through the legislature right now. So, um, you know, uh, it gets really tough on some of these things, but you're seeing a, a majority of the House and Senate Republicans right now that are moving some serious criminal justice reform bills through, uh, and Greg Treat's been a big backer of that as the pro tem of the Senate. The one thing, you know, you mentioned, like, does a Democrat being in there necessarily fix the job? I have to say, well, what kind of a Democrat? Because, you know, for example, we have somebody who just launched a campaign for district attorney, right? One of the most powerful positions, um, especially for Oklahoma County, right? Um, and with a jail that is already more than above capacity, I mean, you know, 13 floors, right? That building is literally sinking into the ground. It is, a, it is an emergency, Right. Um, you know, one of the big proponents, at least in my camp, uh, that we talk po like policy wise, th talking about things like ending cash bail. Right. A mm -hmm. proposal that ended up failing at the state level. Uh, we talk about, you know, with st uh, Representative Nicole Miller with automatic expungements, that's called decarceration. <laughs> automatic decarceration. Um, you know, State Representative Maury Turner likes to talk about no new fines, no new crimes. That's something that we, you know, as the state that continues to incarcerate the most number of people, we shouldn't be trying to do that whatsoever. My question to uh, is, what exactly are we going to do with all of the money that we end up putting into these things like the jail? There's been a proposal about talking about putting different bond issues on the primary ballot to see um, how exactly we fund this. Personally, I'm, I'm somebody who's gonna encourage people to vote no because I think you should put $1 billion into literally anything else. Um, you know, I mean, it, it is the fact, right? You know, the jail trust, for example, you know, that Chad sits on, um, oversees and directs what sort of the finances of this jail really looks like, right? Um, a Democrat, a single Democrat being at the county level isn't going to solve everything. There are nine county positions. There are three county commissioners. If you don't have majority control of those county commissioners, then we're not going to be able to implement our policies. If you don't have majority of those county seats, you're not going to have control of the budget board the budget board that controls all the money that goes into the county. 
So for us, it's literally a coordinated effort. We need, like, it is literally a numbers game. You need five out of the nine positions. Not only do you need five out of the nine positions, you need to make sure you have the right people in those positions. And so on our side, we run into the issue of, do we have enough people running in the first place, which the answer is most of the time, no. And do we have the like good, qualified individuals who want to do that job at the same time? So if we can't even get in through the first part of the gate, I don't even know how we're going to get to number two. So I, you know, I work for a nonprofit called Oklahoma Progress Now. We're a 501c4 group. We are a dark money group, and that's also because we have to do that in order to ensure that, um, you know, we win. The big thing with us is, um, especially on like the Democratic Party side, and this is the common trope whenever it comes to the left, is like we're so busy fighting each other that we don't fight the other side. And for me, it's all about who has the, again, with factions, who has the biggest faction within the party? You look at Nevada, I mean, you know, regardless of how you feel about Democratic Socialists of America, they took over their state party. Are they doing a great job administering? Not necessarily, but they did. And it's actually a possibility that's much more likely to happen in parties across the Midwest because of how disorganized that they are. It's all about getting enough people. It's a team sport, no matter what. Yeah, and I will also direct you, Kiara, to uh, a great debate panel I had in 2020 uh, on criminal justice reform. In fact, uh, former Speaker of the House, Republican Chris Steele, runs Oklahoma's for criminal Oklahomans for criminal justice reform, uh, and he sat on my panel, and it was a really good conversation. So, um, it, it, all parties, we all care, right, uh, about criminal justice, about the safety of our state. And, so. and that's one thing, when it comes to the county jail, um, we have no control over who's brought to us, sure. and for what reason, yeah. and we don't have our lean control over who gets left out. That's They're not judges. I mean... <laughs> That really is the issue. We don't have control. We did set up a speed lane for minor violations of people that never, I mean, that we're, we know they're getting out, they know they're getting bonded, so they don't even have to go through the going to, unless they're in there for a more serious offense. Um, but I can tell you the problems at that jail are not going to be solved without a new job because it's just structurally impossible. Um, it should have never been built the way it was, and it's been a disaster the whole time. I remember. When they opened it, it was, what, two weeks before the first person escaped out of the, the cinder blocks? The escape-proof no, jail. They knocked jail. through the cinder box and put new sheets and got out in one. I mean, that wow. it's been a problem since the first two weeks. Yep. I'd love to see a rehab center, though. I would love to see all the money that tribes put from their gaming into the state that the state doesn't actually report on how they spend it. I would love to see that money put towards a solution for the whole criminal justice thing that's actually kind of like being a divisive thing for people right now because it's like um, when you see like your state leader get up on TV and he says that this is the biggest problem we have is those Indians and this jail stuff. Um, and I'm like over here going like, isn't like $550 million enough? Mm -hmm. Like the, fed, the, the federally recognized tribes in Oklahoma who game, each and every one of them compact with the state and shave off the top a percentage of their profits. For the Muscogee Creek Nation alone, that's something like $155 million a year. You can assume the five, five tribes have at least in that realm of the same amount of money, and that's over $500 million right there. Where's that money? Couldn't that be helping criminal justice in Oklahoma? All right, any other audience questions? Fabulous. Let's give our panel one last round of applause. Thank you all for being here today.